I see all of you. All right, welcome everyone who's joining us live. It's really great to have you in person today. For those watching the recording later, um, hope this is a good conversation that you're eager to catch up on. So today we're gonna start a series of conversations we're gonna have over the next few weeks about the events of 1948, which Palestinians refer to as the Nakba or catastrophe, for Israelis is the creation of the state of Israel. And as we'll dive deeper into and continue unpacking, these are, are two very different perspectives of one set of facts of what happened. Um, and as we proceed, we'll, we'll lean into our principle of, principle of peacemaking, of holding competing perspectives in tension. It's really important to listen to understand the stories we're going to be hearing over the next few weeks so we can better understand the history, not just for the sake of understanding history, but also to understand where we are today and, and how that contributes to the facts on the ground, the reality, and, and opportunities for us as peacemakers. So today I'm not going to say a whole lot before we dive into the short film that Tillis has made that helps us unpack one person's story of what happened in 1948 and through today. Um, and then we'll, we'll dive into a conversation. We've got my colleague Jack with us today who's on the ground in Jaffa and who's a really great resource for connecting what happened in 1948, that history and context with some of the ongoing events we're seeing today. And we'll also have a little bit of time to talk about, you know, the situation on the ground right now in Israel, Palestine, what's going on, how it relates to all of the stuff that we're talking about and we'll continue talking about. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, any questions or clarifications before we start screening it? It's about half an hour long. All right, I will get it pulled up. to live side by side with my Jewish brothers, whether in one state, and if some do not accept that because they are too mighty, militarily speaking, then in two states, but I want to live because Palestine is also my home, my homeland. I was born in a small village in Upper Galilee called Kafar Baram. It's a very peaceful village. We are around 2,000 inhabitants. We, all of them were Christians. The big majority was Maronite Christians, not Mennonite, but Maronites. Well, I, I was eight years old when suddenly something happened in our uh, village. So 1948, my father of good memory told us children, we might see Jewish soldiers coming to our village. They had machine guns, but be not afraid, they do not kill. Father said, these are survivors of a certain satanic plan aiming at destroying all the Jews in the world and started in Europe and Germany. 
we will welcome them as our blood brothers. And three days later, the unexpected happened. The soldiers started coming to our village. They had machine guns. They did not kill anybody. They did not oppress anybody. They did not hurt anybody. On the corner, they accepted our food and they accepted our beds. And we lived on the roof of the house for 10 days. After that, the officer of the army, whose name I remember was Manu, Mr. Manu, was a frightening person, ordered all his families of Baram to come and see him the next morning. My father was with them, surely. They went to see the army. And the officer said, you have to leave immediately home. Go take wife and children and leave for two weeks. And that's for security reasons. What can simple peasant say in front of such orders except obeying? Father and others went home, took what they could from their clothes and things like that. And we left the village. I remember when I left, I was eight years old. I could not carry so many things. I carried a blanket on my shoulder, the only thing I could carry. And we went about two kilometers away from the village to our lands. I know where our land is still. There was a small spring water. And we spent two weeks, as the officer says, within two weeks you will be able to return. And he gave us a written promise in the name of the Israeli army. You will come back in two weeks. For us children, it was exciting to live under trees, to eat figs, grapes, cactus fruits. After one week, it became so boring. We started nagging our parents. We want to go home, we want to go home. You have their promise, they will allow us to go home. So all the heads of families gathered together and went down the hill where we were to the village to meet with the officer of the army. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting. They never came back. We did not know what happened to them. Did they escape to the nearby Lebanon? Were they imprisoned? Were they killed? How come that our parents disappeared? We had no answer whatsoever. We did not stay under the trees. We went to a nearby village where there were still inhabitants. And we found a room about 30, uh, 60 square meters. And we were 11 persons. We lived in that one room. And what I remember from that, every evening, mother would gather us all all the children, and she would pray. She would pray for the government so that God changes their stone heart into heart of flesh, to have some commiseration, some mercy. She would pray for her children, and mainly she would pray for the return of her husband, wherever she is might be. And that continued for three months. One evening, while we were praying, someone pushed the door of that room. Our door could not be locked because it was so primitive, so simple. It was Father. We were so amazed. Father is there. We ran and grabbed him. Father, now you stay, don't go. And he kept saying, I'm coming to stay. And he told us what happened to them. When they left us down to the village, the army prepared big military trucks and they loaded them like cattle, like animals on the trucks and drove them so far away to the neighborhood of a city called Nablus. It was something unknown for us, so far away. 
and there in front of the new design borders. The army said, look here, this land does no more belong to you. You have to leave, you cross the borders and go wherever you want. If you try to come back, we'll kill you before you trespass the borders. This land does no more belong to you. Who are you, man, to decide that this land does not belong to its owner? But that's what the rule was, might is right. So father knew very well the way back home from Beirut to Baram, which is on the Lebanese border. He took some of his friends and they infiltrated back through the borders to find us in Baram. That's how we, the family was joined back together. It's amazing, despite all the odds, the suffering, and the disappointment that my father went through, he never allowed himself to hate. He never allowed him, himself to think about taking revenge or about violence. He instructed us children, do not believe in violence. If you believe in violence, you will fall victim of violence. But he did not stay quiet. He gathered all the men who remained there from Baram, convinced them to join, to gather some money and to go to the Supreme Court of Justice of Israel, filing the first case against Israel. And the first resolution was in our favor. These are peaceful people. They have the right to return. But the army opposed. We could not implement that. They went back in 1950 to that High Court of Justice. Second resolution in their favor. These are people who have the right to return home. The army still opposed. They went in 1951 back again. The, they were very stubborn. They wanted to return home. And I understand why. If you visit Baram, you understand how dear is it for its own people. The third resolution was in our favor. So although the army still opposed, we decided to return no matter what. We gathered our small belonging that was nothing important. And we marched from the village Jesh to Baram, five kilometers distance. We were walking and we were about to enter the village, 500 meters away from the first house. Something happened. We saw airplanes coming we did not know where from and starting shelling our homes, raining bombs, explosive dynamites in our home and our church as well. We stood there and we cried. Men were crying, women were crying, children were crying out of fear and out of disgust to see their homes blown into the air. But there's no one to, to listen, no heart to be moved. We became the refugees. When I go there today, and I often go there, I stand on the ruins of my father's house and always wonder why did they destroy the village. Much later on, when I was the Archbishop in Haifa, the President of the State of Israel decided to come and visit me at home, to wish us Happy Christmas for all the Christians, but to their bishop. I told him, we welcome you very warmly, with much affection, and I welcome you in my quality of a refugee deportee from Baram. I allow myself to remind you that the village was destroyed, but the people are still alive, and they want to return home. When was that? It was long ago. You were eight years old. It's long, long ago. Didn't you still forget that Baram is your home, home village? I looked at him and said, Mr. Perez, you were deported from Palestine 2,000 years ago, not by a Palestinian leader, 
but by a Roman leader. And you still remember that Palestine is your home. You came back to take part of your home, you took all of it, and you turned our life into misery. Tell me, when are you going to forget that Palestine is your home? I was not meant to be a priest and not less to be a, an archbishop. I remember I learned the Bible on the lab of my mother. Between other things she used to say to me, do not believe that our compatriot, that means Jesus Christ, our compatriot came here just to teach us nice things. He came here to teach us how to live a new, a new way. It's there that I learned that love is much more powerful than hatred. That violence can breed violence only. So the bishop had to opt between Rome and Paris. So I spent six years in Paris, studying in the Sorbonne and the Institut Catholique. They taught us so many things. You can't imagine how much. We studied everything that has to do with theology, with church affairs. And after six years, I was ready for priesthood. Now I can tell you something. From all that I learned in Paris, I forgot everything. Only one thing I cannot forget. God does not kill. Whoever kills, he is persecuting God himself, and he will be accountable in front of God. God does not kill. All the rest is not important for me. And I came back. Two weeks later, I was ordained priest in Nazareth. One week after my ordination, the bishop called me. Elias, you need to have a parish now, a community. I said, yes, if possible. He said, I decided to send you for one month to a village called Ibelin. Go there, and after one month, we'll decide your final assignment. And ending by founding where Ibelin was. I was shocked. No electricity. No telephone, no water. They received water twice a week. I did not mind. I minded to find where the church is and where my residence is. I was so exhausted, I feel that till now. I wanted to sleep. So I decided to sleep in my first wagon. My bishop forgot me here. And I waited 38 years to see the end of that month come. You're still here. I'm still here after 55 years. And it's God's guidance that helped me to realize that my parish is not this very small village. My parish should be the world, all the world. I decided through that month to visit all the families of the village. And I decided to visit first of all, all the Muslim families. To tell them here I am, I'm your priest. I'm to serve you. I'm happy to know you. You don't know how positive was the answer of the Muslims. In 1978, I noticed that our children here go to study in Haifa, in Nazareth, elsewhere. They travel one or two hours every day to go to school and to come back. 
I was praying to be able to open a school. Here, this place that was meant to become a Jewish colony, to separate Abilene from Shifar Amr. That's why they refused adamantly to give me a building permit. I said, what do I need? Do I need a building permit or I need a building? So I started building without building permit. The police came three months later. We were always coming up with the columns. Asked me, where is your building permit? I said, I don't have a building permit. He said, how can you build without building permit? I said, sir, I never built with building permits. I always built with sand, cement, steel, stones. He was shocked. He said, you don't do that in a civilized country. I said, I wish you were civilized enough. You would have given me a building permit. If I build without building permit, it's only in order to teach you to become more civilized. I was 37 times in court, always for building permits, till I became Archbishop. And 1981, the beginning of September, we opened a school with 80 children, boys and girls, four teachers, one lady and three gentlemen. We did not have electricity. We drew a cable from the nearest neighbor, about 100 meters far away, to have projections when we need electricity. Water we got from the village, from the authority in the village and nobody was able legally to cut the water away because there were people living here, children. This is a Christian school? Does that mean that all the students are Christians? <laughs> when I opened the school, I declared to everybody, this school is not a religious school. It's not a commercial school and it's not a political school. This school is meant for everybody who was born baby. Everybody. Now in the school, we have 3,000 students. 65% of my children are Muslim boys and girls. I adore them, I love them. You can't imagine how nice they are, how generous they are, how loving each other they are. It's none building. of your business. <laughs> <laughs> when we built the gymnasium, it was impossible. For three young years, we were working to have the building permit. When we built the, build, the, the gymnasium, they said, this time you will have your building permit. Your drawings are perfect. But bear with us. Our bureaucracy is so slow. I will leave them busy with their slow bureaucracy. I'll get myself busy with building. One year later, the police came. You don't have yet your building permit. I said, no. He said, you are summoned back to a court. And if you add one stone, you will be imprisoned and everything will be destroyed. I did everything possible to have the building permit. No, no use. One day I was completely despairing. I said, boy, why do I, are you so negative? Don't forget that in order to reach the Israeli government in Jerusalem, the shortest way is to go to Washington. What do I 
money from you Americans. I'm afraid if I ask you money, it will be a kind of conscience tranquilizer. And I'm far from wishing any tranquility for your conscience. I want you to share that trouble in which I am living. I rented a car and decided to pop in unannounced into the residence of the American Secretary of State, the Foreign Minister. Who was at the time? Jim Baker. Went, knocked on the door. Secretary of State was not there. His wife, Susan Baker, came to open the door. Said, who are you? Said, ma'am, I am another man from Galilee. Said, do you have an appointment with us? Said, madam, we men from Galilee, we never make appointments, we make appearances. She was shocked. She did not want to get me in. I was on the exit door when she said, I'm sorry, I am so busy now with 20 American ladies. We have a Bible study hour. Ah, what are you studying, ma'am? She said, we are having a look on the Sermon on the Mount. I said, well, good luck, I pity you. Why do you pity her? Because what will you be able to understand? It's not written by an American person, but by the Palestinian. And he did not write it in your American language, but in one of my Semitic language. What will you be able to understand? Good luck, ma'am. And Susan Baker said, do, can you help us understand it better? <laughs> what, what could I wish more? I went on, took me two hours, explaining the eight first verses of the Sermon on the Mount, thought we bad. I left Baker's house, leaving behind me, Blood Brothers and We of the Land, my two first books. And one week later, while I was sitting in my office, the telephone rang, it was Susan Baker. And she started praying as if she was ready. After she stopped, I said a few words. And that was it. This operation, speaking together on the telephone, became a kind of once every month, two, three times every month. We'd pray together. And more than once, a third person would interrupt our prayers saying, now it's to me to pray, you stop, both of you. It was the Secretary of State himself. We became prayer partners. Soon after two months, I ceased being this strange fellow, this Oriental clergy, this bearded man from the Middle East who knocked unannounced on our door. I became for them the Abuna. A few years later, Jim Baker called me himself for the first time, saying, Abuna, I'm pleased to tell you, I'm coming with Susan to visit you in your school. He came. It's time now we go and pray for peace and justice. And we went to our chapel, then it was a grotto that we dug in the rock. And there in the bottom of the earth, we prayed for peace and justice. And with so much love, 
for the persecutor and for the persecuted. All right, I know some of you on this call have seen that before, but I hope you got something different out of seeing it again. Um, we've got about a half hour left to have some discussion together coming out of the film, um, inspired by some of the themes it raises, but also this is our, our time together. So we can take it in a, a different direction in terms of what's happening right now in the country, tying that in as well. So Jack, I wanna start while we've got you on the call, um, any thoughts you have? starting out connecting what we just saw with this current moment, or if you'd rather, you know, we can open up the floor for questions from folks as well. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, I guess I'd, I'd love to hear people's reactions, questions. Um, we did this, I don't know how many of you know, but we did this during the pandemic. We started uh, filming uh, some interviews with, with some of our core partners. And we thought it would be perfect to start with Abu Shakur, just because he, you know, this story, his story brings about so many themes. Um, he's a Palestinian citizen of Israel, firsthand, uh, you know, he experienced the neck of the catastrophe firsthand. Um, and yet he also chose to, to kind of um, challenge the, the discrimination inside of Israel against Palestinians. It, you know, in a nonviolent way up against the system um, through the courts and through kind of personal relationships, which is uh, a lot of what peacemaking is about. So, so I, I mean, I love that we started with, with, with this episode with uh, Elias Shakur. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I just love to, to hear more about what, what others took away from it and if they had any questions. We're a small enough group, so feel free and jump in if you've got a thought to share. Yeah. I thought one of his his uh, most profound statements, and it's it's a sad, to me, a, a sad commentary on the potential for peace and flourishing, is that uh, the best way to get to Jerusalem is through Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, it makes me think, and I, I don't know if I heard it on uh, uh, a telos um, website or something else, but the protests that are going on on one hand make me feel um, optimistic, but if the result of the protest is to take it back to the way it was, the way it was, was broken. And I, I don't know, I just don't know if the Israelis that are protesting want peace and flourishing, or they want the version that I was exposed to when I was there in November. The really important. Yeah, we're still. Go ahead, Jack. No, just we're still waiting to find that out. I mean, these protests. The yeah, I guess the the hope is that they're they're still going on. There's still potential for change. Um, we we just the story is not over yet, so we don't know, but. Yeah. It's a Thank conversation you. we've been having internally too as a team and, and you know I think among our network is what does it mean to be folks who have seen kind of behind the the status quo before these protests started who know that there's more to this story than just the the most recent pro protests trying to protect democracy um, and that moment I think for for me as someone who's American who's not Israeli or Palestinian I've been trying to lean into in my conversations with other folks who know I care about this who are seeing headlines again and share a little bit of that narrative, um, encouraging them to ask those questions about whose voices aren't at these protests. Why are they predominantly Jewish Israelis? And then there's not a lot of overlap with anti-occupation protests and talking about um, what does it mean to, to push the US government to support Israelis and Palestinians and our commitment to democracy in a way that recognizes that we don't just need to return to the status quo. So I, it's absolutely a, a heavy moment. And I think it's one that 
you know, for folks who who do see the violence is almost disheartening, as you were saying, Tom, because there's so much work to do already. And this feels like it's headed in the wrong direction. But as people pay attention, there is also opportunity to try and try and push a little bit when they are tuned in because they aren't always tuned in. Well, we, we saw, you know, uh, instances where uh, Palestinians, uh, citizens of Israel, tried to participate in, in, uh, in the demonstrations and uh, with a Palestinian flag. And, and, you know, they were attacked and removed and <laughs> the flag thrown away. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that this kind of moment of historical moment and a very impressive response by the Israeli public uh, to, you know, the judicial review or reform, um, that it did not go beyond, you know, did not go beyond the the, the narrow, uh, you know, Israeli interest and did not take into account you know the the freedom and democracy in a, in, a, in a slightly wider context, just slightly wider context. Um, well, one thing that impressed me in the film is is the this use of building permits. I mean, it's uh, I, I used to think that it's a tactic uh, used uh, per, only in the occupied territories. Uh, but then I learned that it it's actually gets used all the time in Israel proper. Um, you know, any attachment that anything that could further the attachment of Palestinians anywhere between the river and the sea uh, is something that you know the Israeli system does not want to happen. And of course, a building permit is is a is a form of attachment to the land. Uh, and I think the other side of this is that you get this, uh, you know, constant reminder of who's in charge. And, uh, you know, the acts of oppression that take place, uh, at least in part, is to remind the Palestinians of who is in charge and not to get out of line. I don't know, Jack, if that sounds right to you it's good to see you again by the way nice to see you as well yeah for sure i think i mean one of also the things that uh yes of course story brings about is the the issue of kofor Beram. so kofor Beram and ikrit another village that was depopulated in 1948 were two christian villages right up north um against the lebanese border um, and they were told to to kind of leave the village because they were on the border with Lebanon um, and that they would return a couple of weeks later. And so, as you heard, they were, you know, they were not allowed to go back, even though there had been Israeli Supreme Court cases ruling in their favor and telling the Israeli, you know, Israeli state and government that these folks have a right to go back to their homes. They've now stayed inside the state of Israel and you know, ultimately they became citizens. And oftentimes you know, what we, we talk about the re right of return for refugees, for Palestinian refugees. So just to make, you know, to continue that analogy between between Palestinians in the West Bank or Palestinians uh, elsewhere in the diaspora. And, and we say, you know, the, the, the right of refugees and the right of return for Palestinians is one of the five core issues Israelis and Palestinians really have to agree on it. Where are they going to live? Where, but here in this case, we see that even internally displaced Palestinians, so refugees that were created in 1948 that weren't kicked out of the country, but then became citizens of the state of Israel and live in that state, and so have access to that land, you know, and can visit the land. So Abu Shakur, you know, go can go into that land, which, by the way, now is a is a national park that you have to pay a fee to enter, um, they cannot go back and live on their own land that they, you know, the, the place where he was born, where his family, his family was from and where his, his descendants were buried. Um, there's a church there and a cemetery, but that's, that's about it. And so it, it really does, you know, 
call that whole thing into question. Why, well, why is it that? And the only answer I've I've been able to come up with is exactly what you shared, uh, and it's, it's control. It's control and who and and resources. Who do the resources go to? Who do the permits go to? Who does the land go to? Um, and it's exclusive. And as long as it's exclusive, we're seeing that you know, obviously the Palestinians lose in the short term. But this this moral corruption it will you know show its face also to the Israeli side, um, as they're seeing. And and the frustrating part is, as Tom mentioned, I mean it's 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 the lack of ability to connect how these illiberal policies that have guided a lot of the occupation and the settlement enterprise that now have seeped into mainstream Israeli society, there's a lack of, of understanding that these are one in the same. That's, I think, the big missing piece in the puzzle right now. And the million dollar question is, how do we make all those hundreds of thousands of Israelis realize that this is the centerpiece of it? This is this moral corruption, the, the occupation, the discrimination even within Israel is exactly what you're up against here. Um, not just, you know, this one single person that in Yahoo and his judicial reform kind of thing. Um, Sarah, I wanted to offer um, um, it's new to this rich discussion. There might be an avenue. There's language that you used at the beginning and is also used in the film. And we've, I've always used it and I became conscious of it today that the Palestinians call the catastrophe of 48 the Nakba and Jews call the, the events of 1948 the, uh, the, the founding of the State of Israel and the War of Independence. They are both of those things. They're not to Jews or to Palestinians. If we are creating a shared narrative, you know, instead of a polarized narrative, the Nakba is a tragedy that occurred as a result of the founding of the state of Israel. Those two things are facts and they lay side by side and they don't need to belong to Jews or to Palestinians. Those stories can belong to all of us as we enter, you know, a shared narrative of, of pain, of trauma, of recognizing that one person relief from trauma was actually uh, created on the backs, um, excuse me, of another and created another trauma. You know, I think the most valuable thing often to talk about Israel Palestine is to say that, um, excuse me, uh, Palestinians are the victims of the victims. And I think it's really, really easy to sort of forget part of that story, you know, to, you know, either part, you know, so you only think of the victims that relate to you. Um, excuse me, not the fact that all are victims in their own way, except one now has power over the other. And that is the moral dilemma that you just spoke of, Jack, that you cannot have a moral society if you have rights for you that don't extend to the others that you live around. Yeah, thanks for raising that, Jeff. I think the goal is absolutely to arrive at a point where there is a shared narrative and a shared reckoning of, of collective history. One of the reasons we start with asking people to hold two perspectives in tension is when people have not just failed to see, but have willfully turned away from one perspective of history that disagrees with their own, asking them to try and arrive at that shared history without holding it in its unique perspective. Um, sometimes people right, filter that through their own perspectives and opinions, and, and we don't always arrive at a shared narrative. People feel like we have, but it's still very much rooted in it's still filtered through my lens. It's still within the frameworks that I, I believe in. I'm bringing more in, but I still get to dictate like the parameters of that discourse. I still get to dictate what the, the shared narrative is. And so I, I hope ultimately, right, everyone does arrive where this is shared history. And part of the process of arriving there for folks who haven't heard, especially narratives of Nakba, is to say, what is this perspective? What is this story in its, its unique truth that I haven't heard? And, and where are the opportunities then to put it in conversation with the one I have heard, or the, you know, even in the US, the predominant narrative around the creation of state of Israel 
Um, so yeah, absolutely agreeing with you that that's the goal where we arrive, where there is one narrative of who we are as a people in the U.S. and Israel, Palestine. I think that's, that's an important part towards peace and justice. Um, but before we get there, I think it's important to be able to also step back and say these are the individual perspectives that we fail to see in that collective narrative. Certainly, and I'll I'll just add very briefly to that, Sarah. Uh, the reason for my point is not that you know I have this sort of ideological vision that we'll all share things together, but I think we're a long way from that. It's that the soon as we separate and say that narrative is yours and not mine, we have permission to dismiss it. So if we say the Nakba is the result of the 1948 war and that created the independent state of Israel, we are stating that those things are joined, that those two events are together and they don't belong to one or the other. They are the truth. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. I have a question and maybe um, Sarah and Jack from different perspectives. It, it feels to me, I'm not a politician and don't live in Washington, D.C., that there is a younger generation that is more in tune, actually in Congress, maybe not in the Senate, but in the House, of some of the um, trauma and injustice and lack of um, social justice in poor Palestinians in Palestine. Um, last year, when when um, I was able to to be in Palestine, we visited Al Walaja. If I'm saying that right, um, and I believe Jack, there were um, a number of Congress people who had come and visited that, and maybe that visit directly or indirectly helped prevent or postpone some demolition of some homes. So I guess a couple things, Sarah, are you seeing? in Washington, any kind of a upswing in true empathy towards the situation? And then I guess, Jack, what else as a Telos family can we do other than pestering our, um, our representatives um, to really get people over there and, and see the situation and build relationships? That's the only way. It's great to read about it, but I'm, I'm sure the hearts were broken open by the representatives that were able to see um, that village and and really kind of take something personally back. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but. Jack, I'll let you go first. Um, I mean, there's a number of things we, we can do and I totally agree with you, Tom, that these experiences from my perspective and my experience have really, you know, shifted and and transformed people that were ideologically opposed or, you know, wouldn't recognize that there was such a thing as a Palestinian. There had been people on our trips that, you know, were ideologically very, very adamantly kind of um, Zion, Christian Zionist or, or Zionist in their thinking to the degree that they would you know, not see Palestinians as deserving of being in the land at all. And so, but when you're faced with with the, with, with some of the things that go, are going on and you see them firsthand and you experience them and then you sit with multiple sides, I think there's nothing that beats that. Um, I guess the way we can mimic it just a little bit and because we also have to recognize that we can't bring hundreds of thousands or millions of Americans over. Um, but there's a real need for things to change on the ground. So how do we both kind of address the short term and the long term? So I guess in the short term, there's, and, and we can, you know, follow up with this, but there, as well as your, for instance, that you're right, there were 40 Congre members of Congress that, that signed on to a letter and helped freeze the demolitions that were there. And then that pressure made the Israeli government um, go into negotiations with the villagers and, and actually told them to go and, and draw up their own plans. Um, and, and so now they're fundraising. So one of the short term things is, you know, to help with um, financial need that these the, the village people need, the people of Walidja need. Um, to draw up, to work with the engineers and draw up uh, the structural um uh the the infrastructure planning there 
And then the longer term is to keep educating. I mean, and that that was one of really the the essences and the reasons why we we continued to work during the pandemic and and get these stories on film because we and you know and this is why we're sharing this resource with you is is for you to to maybe be able to to share some of these experiences through these personal stories with others around you that might be interested and and once you're exposed to some stories that you don't know then we hope people on their own journey or or with some help from from you all can go on that kind of a rabbit hole of research and learning and to really understand more because once you start learning you you really start to see it everywhere you start to see see it in the news all of a sudden even though you know this conflict is has is and has always been there um but a lot of times after people start learning about it they start to see oh wait now now i understand what a settlement is now i i see what what they're talking about with these protests that are happening in israel um and so yeah so there's multiple avenues to enter here there's kind of short-term needs that we can help people on the ground there's resources like this film that we can share with our communities that aren't able to come on trips and then ultimately if people have the resources and the time i mean we have multiple trips coming up and and we'll continue to do that and so we of course welcome uh more and more folks to to do these journeys to answer your other Sarah. question or to try to and tom this is dangerous you're putting me on my soapbox um i think one of the things for me that's always important to keep in mind as i watch young elected representatives but then just young leaders in general is that we inherit the frameworks of conversation that folks have laid before us so all of these young elected representatives who are stepping into this, this context, who are stepping into the political arena and conversation, um, are coming into waters that are not, they're, they're not ones that see Palestinian flourishing and standing with Israel as, as compatible. And so when folks then are committed to standing for Palestinian human rights and advocating for them, they get that label of right, anti-Israeli or anti-Semitic put on them in a way that makes it very hard for them to actually effectively advocate for Palestinian human rights, but then also to advocate for a more nuanced conversation about, right, the fact that advocating for Palestinian human rights and combating anti-Semitism has to be part and parcel of the same conversation. They can't be separated. Um, that's it's really important. Like, I believe very firmly in that. And that's not what Congress is set up to do right now. That's not the, the framework of the dialogues that are happening. Um, it's still very much folks who come in, you're expected to right, toe the party line and be pro-Israel. And maybe you care about some Palestinian human rights. Maybe you can sign on to Belly, Betty McCollum's bill around, you know, combating child detention. But for the whole, like your big, your whole political career is tied to, right, your party and whether or not you're able to get support more broadly. And right now that still is that like, that need to commit to being traditionally pro-Israel. And that's where, again, I think there's opportunity as we work on changing culture to really model that being pro-Palestinian human rights is not anti-Israeli or anti-Israel or anti-Semitic um, to in our actions and not just our words demonstrate that advocating for Palestinian human rights has to be, again, part and parcel of combating anti-Semitism. And the more we're able to kind of change a national discourse or dialogue around that in our communities, the easier it will be, hopefully, um, for our elected representatives to also be able to have those conversations. And, you know, on the one hand, I feel a lot of hope that there are more young elected representatives who care very deeply about Palestinian human rights. And also, I, I think there are dangers in that kind of bifurcated framework of you have to be pro one and anti the other that that leads to more harm, um, even when there are good intentions or, you know, unintentional anti-Semitism. It, it doesn't benefit anyone, including Palestinians, to fall into this binary system of pro and anti. And that's maybe a, a more convoluted answer, Tom, than you asked. But I think that that's a, a real, reality that's facing a lot of young folks who who care deeply about Palestinian rights, who do not want to be anti-Semitic, but who aren't inheriting frameworks that make that very easy. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I'll just crawl back into my cave and, and not pay attention because I, I when I hear stuff, I try and latch on to a little bit of hope. <laughs> But I understand what you're saying, and I agree. I just, you know, I am I'm trying to hope that the the young representatives that are speaking out that it's not a flash in the pan, but it's it's going to take a long time to get the system to change. I I understand. 
Yeah. And I'm also hopeful it's not a flash in the pan. Like I, I have to write, I'm young enough that I have to believe that simple actions matter. I can't crawl into my cave yet. Um, but that's where I, I do think I come back to what one of our other partners, Mitri Rahab, has said that hope is what you do. And right, none of us can feel hope all the time, but I think in our actions and how we choose to show up, that that is where like I find the most hope in this work in in folks committing to genuinely, you know, working for Palestinian human rights, genuinely combating anti-Semitism, um, committing to both the cultural and political work of changing these realities. Um, and yeah, I, I don't mean to always be high and lofty like idealist, but I, I think there really is a reality that there are folks who are doing this work and will continue doing this work. And the more we can align ourselves with them, as with Wolaja, the, the more impact we can hopefully help them have. Yeah, I want to be aware it's two o'clock. I'm happy to stay for 10 more minutes because I know it's a, a tight half hour when we show a film, but I also recognize we're at time. So if you need to hop off, please feel free and hop off. Otherwise, Jack, I don't know if you have 10 more minutes, but I'd love to, to keep going um, for a little longer. I, I have a quick question for, for Jack. Uh, uh, my understanding is that in Israel, you're not even supposed to talk about the Nakba. You're not supposed to mention the Nakba. To what extent is that true? And is there punishment involved? If you can shed some light on that, please. Yeah. Um, there was a law some years back, I want to say about 10 years ago, that was maybe less, um, that was passed that took away funding from national institutions that taught about or commemorated the Nakba. So that was uh, the way that as there was, there was becoming kind of more and more momentum of this generation, kind of my generation and younger of Palestinians trying to educate about the Nakba, trying to commemorate the Nakba in, in public spaces, at universities and things like that. Um, that was kind of uh, the ramifications of that. And so there was a, a yeah, there was a, a law punishing kind of the commemoration of the Nakba in public institutions, but you could still do it privately. Um, and there are, uh, you know, there's an organization, there's an Israeli organization that's really working towards um, educating and commemorating uh, around the Nakba. It's called Zuchrot, um, you know, founded by Jewish Israelis that, and, and they're only growing stronger because they're, they're seeing that, this is a central part of the the conflict, but also the narratives on the ground between people. Um, a lot of times it comes back to this, you know, initial story of displacement of, you know, Arab Israelis versus Palestinian citizens of Israel, you know, taking away that identity. And with it all, you're you're really kind of erasing Palestinian identity. And so in order to start teaching about Palestinian identity, who Palestinians are, why they refer to them as Palestinian citizens, themselves as Palestinian citizens of Israel, we always go back to the Nakba. And so, and so Palestinians and Israelis alike have, have you know, more recently and, and continually um, keep going back and educating more on that, even though there's been kind of backlash from the state. Our next events, the film screening of Tantura and then the panel discussion, will dive into that question more to Raja of what does it mean for Israelis to tell the narrative of the Nakba as an Israeli narrative, Jeff, to point back to what you were saying. Um, and if you haven't seen that film, I highly encourage you to, to come join us for one of the screenings. Um, it's it's a, a big film. It's got a lot of important themes. It's a heavy one, I think, to wrestle with. Um, yeah. Yeah, and in, in the panel discussion that follows, we're going to spend some time with with Palestinians and Israelis unpacking the impact of that for them, what it means personally to recognize this history um, in the context of right belonging and doing this work. And yeah, as as we said at the beginning of this call, this is kind of the, the first step into this ongoing conversation because this isn't one we could do in just one one week or one session. And so I hope you all come back and join us for those as we build on those really important themes you raised. Well, thank you, folks. I've got to go. We'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you all for joining. Really appreciate your thank time. Thank you all and for see joining. You on the next one. It's great to see you all.